Freud believed that any attempts to stop violence with laws and high values is self-defeating. Because entering into society and becoming a human being doesn't mean that one stops being an instinctual being with desires that must be satisfied and drives that can't be stopped. In his book, Civilization and Its Discontents, he argues that guilt can no longer regulate modern society because any repressive measures and guilt-inducing lead to more chaos rather than order. The release of one's repressed desires in modern society gives the individual pleasure, but in response, she or he becomes a threat to the social order, an anarchist, and must be controlled because social order and modernity is not the opposite of freedom, but the expression of freedom to order life according to the agreeable rules and laws to form. Since the aim of modern life is to maintain peace and harmony, individuals in a modern society are constantly required to repress their instincts and submit their bodies to the lawgiver. The only way to get ahead, workers, management, and money partners striving together to produce a better product at a price more people can pay. And as they succeed, all of us can have more of the good things of life, higher standards of living. But this is just a delusion, since any act of repression, the purposeful forgetfulness of the animalistic side of the being of the human, leads to even more disastrous violent outbursts than the previous one, which in return will require even more repressive measures, and so on and on. What all of this means is that culture and modernity became the means by which human nature could be controlled, and as a result, the individual is doomed to feel guiltier and society to become more chaotic. Men became scared. Overproduction, they cried. Overproduction, they cried. Let's remake America. For Freud, the modern individual then is violent due to the forceful orientation of society toward order at any cost. But this approach fails to acknowledge that modern individuals value politics and justice. They are not driven by the desire to destroy, to resist order, and break the law just so their bodies will be free, but they want to be free to form a new order. One in which their voices can be heard and their point of view will be taken into account out of the desire to have a meaningful existence. People in formal and corrupt social environments then have a flair for destruction because telling the truth, obeying the law blindly, and following the rules and costumes don't make sense to them, and in fact, it can make them feel crazy. This is why only surrealist, perverted, and shocking works of art speak to them. They describe how reality concretely is, rather than prescribing how it ought to be. And because they don't trust other people in the government, they tend to lie and use sarcasm as a self-defense mechanism. Speaking gives the possibility to tell their truth and agree with others in order to form a unity. But sometimes, when people tell the truth and speak about what is right in formal and corrupt societies, they begin to notice the gap between saying and doing or the abstract and the concrete. And as a result, they feel guilty or they become pessimist. If they feel guilty, they tend to move away from others and instead get closer to God, the most perfect and truthful being, and speak to it in silence in order to be rewarded and recognized for their guilt. If on the other hand, they become suspicious, they tend to tell lies or spread lies instead of confessing to God. Speaking is not only the possibility to tell the truth, but also to tell a lie, to disagree with others, to be separated from others, and to be free from the truth. Supposedly, telling the truth understood as correctness is not a choice, since the truth determines one's judgment the same way mathematical formulas do. And as a result, telling a lie becomes a choice, an expression of one's freedom through defiance. And since sometimes telling the truth doesn't have meaning for the speakers, they find it easier to tell lies and provoke the immoral. But this in return can actually make the meanings of their words more significant and confronts them with the meaning of being with others. The child doesn't know any better but to accept all this as a matter of fact. Most people sometimes have disgusting, violent, and perverted thoughts. Some people have them more frequently to the point that they begin to think that they are losing their mind, psychotic, possessed, or inherently bad. In fact, these thoughts give them so much anxiety precisely because all of their lives they held values that meant to prevent the horrible things they began to think about. And resisting them, confessing to a priest or a friend in order to get reassurance that they are not bad people, or analyzing them in order to find out why they have them, make their obsession about them even worse. 
Surprisingly, what helps them to manage to live with these thoughts is to accept them and even invite them instead of keeping reminding themselves that they are bad or run away from them since it takes away the power they have over them. They feel they are in charge again and got the opportunity to rediscover the significance of love instead of seeking revenge or surrender to the devil that visited their soul. You can't argue or fight with a devil or a bully, but must ignore them until they get tired of you and move on. This means that instead of constantly being forced to gain control over their instincts in order to be normal, the possibility of choosing to be moral can actually free modern individuals from feeling guilty, from punishing themselves, and to curtail their violent tendencies toward others. The acceptance of our imperfection can get us closer to each other and motivates us to have a better future together, while being idealists or religious fanatics can actually make us nihilistic, pessimistic, violent, and hateful. Instead of measuring ourselves against perfection, the ideal or God, and submitting ourselves to it only to feel guilty in the hope to be taken care of in our lifetime and be rewarded after we die, we can accept our imperfections, which will afford us to question again what matters to us and what will motivate us to change. For Freud, we can save ourselves in a repressive normative society by governing ourselves rather than changing the government and the laws, our way to be saved by a transcendent authority. The fantasies, lacks, and lies our concrete reality, bodies, or psyche challenge us with can be managed by trying to grasp the known unknown and find ways in which we can sublimate our instincts through love, art, and religion. But when I do, I don't follow through, cause my heart belongs to daddy. So Freud believes that the Cartesian and Socratic self-knowledge that involves self-limitation and sublimation can make us feel less guilty, and as a result, society will be safer. Instead of forming new order, individuals and modern societies need to learn how to control themselves and reject outside influences, to be independent rather than dependent and responsible rather than being victims of their circumstance and natural physical conditions. But for filmmakers like Josephine Decker, Expressing, rather than sublimating the animalistic aspect of our existence, is more liberating and ethically more beneficial, since by acknowledging the ambiguity of being both a conscious and instinctual being, one doesn't need to repress or violently release his or her animality when it is forced to obey the law or follow social norms. This means that instead of practicing self-mastery, Modern society should be more accommodating to difference and ambiguity in order to break the cycle of order, repression, and chaos Freud describes in Civilization and its Discontents. Characters in films like Madeline's Madeline and Shirley reconnect to their instinctual side in order to be free from codependent and oppressive familial and romantic relationships that instead of letting them be different from others, forcefully try to make them normal. She shows in her films that people become hungry for new meaning when the ways in which they understand themselves and their world don't motivate them any longer, and if they can't satisfy this hunger once again, they tend to resort to physical violence, drunkenness, and promiscuity. That is, they begin to worship Dionysus, to follow the authority of the lower part of the body in the attempt to revolt against the meaningless laws and rules that try to govern their lives. Her characters discovered that this is rather easy since they lose their authority over them the moment they realize that they are not given truths, but possibilities. For Decker then, when one can't be free to be different from others, to try to answer again who she or he is, it is better for her or him to return to nature. When things are bad, conservatives, Marxists, religious thinkers, and psychoanalysts trace the original sin, the source of all human suffering, the source of the problem, in order to renew the human identity, to become human again. And romantic thinkers go back to nature to face the sublime. The platonic ideal forms in order to renew their relation to the truth. But for Decker, the purpose of any return to nature is not a renewal of some origin, but to get inspired to begin anew, to have a different future and become different. She wants her characters and audience to lose themselves to life, this involves a surrender to the whims of their active living bodies that have impersonal goals to purposefully let go of their agency, let go of their own goals in Nietzschean fashion. It is an, an originary pre-reflective experience that has a potential for creativity. When our bodies suffer, we become responsible and tend to obey the law out of the fear of death, 
and when our bodies are vital, we forget ourselves, but it also reminds us of our own vitality, our own potential to initiate a new beginning, and we tend to open ourselves to the world and others. Romantic thinkers and artists want to go back in time, to the past, to the beginning of the story of everything, to some imagined naive and true world, to paradise in which they had a direct contact with the ideal, with that which causes anything to be the way it is. For them, everything that involves human mediation, technology, language, carnal desires, and society at large is bad, and whatever that is supposedly immediate is good. Instead of trying to solve political and social issues, they want to get access to the transcendent truth in the wild in order to save humanity. They are alone, hungry, and constantly get hurt. But these sufferings give them meaning while other pleasures in the city will always leave us dissatisfied. The city is dirty, alienating, and hostile, and because of urban expansion, it is also the source of any major financial crisis that caused millions to suffer but it is impossible to be free from humanity or subjectivity, to ignore the meaning things in the world have for us at this moment in order to know their transcendent truth, or to be free from our desires and drives by avoiding the demands of the body, that is, to exercise asceticism in order to submit ourselves to the transcendent. Besides, forms of freedom can't help us to feel existentially free, that is, to have the ability to shape our world, which is our most profound sense of freedom. The price we have to pay for this freedom is anxiety, since it requires us to make choices and face their unknown consequences, which an appeal to perfection exonerates us from. Obeying God's word or the moral law and revealing the truth with capital T takes us back to paradise, in which the given is seen by us in its completeness. We get peace of mind since everything is already chosen for us, and we don't have to desire or be desired in order to be seen, since we become pure spirit and visible. But in return, we must repress existence, what we experience, and repress our desires, needs, and wishes. That is, we must be willing to be in denial and self-denial. But since this is impossible to attain, we will be condemned to feel guilty. Instead of going back to nature and be naked as animals and protest against society and the love of the ideal, we can stay in the city in order to be free to question the meaning of our everyday life and design new spiritual clothing to cover ourselves with. Nihilism is dangerous, but only purposeful openness to meaning can overcome it. Religious fanatics and neoconservatives don't want to be existentially free and participate in politics, in reshaping their communities and states, since they believe they are invisible forces that determine everything anyway. For them, the cosmic and divine orders that determine their existence can't change, and the only thing we can all do is to hope for the best, look the other way, and feel grateful and unworthy. Instead of politics, they practice nihilism. Their belief is a system that is meant to keep the existing order and power intact. And when this system fails to do so, they spread conspiracy theories which provide unproven explanations for human suffering, ones that sinister forces are responsible for. It is not God or us, your politicians that cause your suffering, but forces that the devil unleashed. But most of us want to have meaningful lives, and as such, we have a desire to be free, to participate in politics, and to make history, rather than ignoring our desires and needs, and submit ourselves to the transcendent in the hope it will save us, waiting to be free by a political order, or reduce our existence to our physical and biological conditions in order to be free from the rational or spiritual altogether, to be free to just be. Without the law, there is no way to prevent injustice. But relying only on the law to save us leads to nihilism and carelessness, to apathy. The solution for brutality and nihilism in modern life then is politics. That is having meaningful discussions about the ways we want to live our lives, rather than putting all our hopes in formal laws or value. Only one thing, whether it is God, science, democracy, or capitalism, and then try to destroy it when it doesn't fulfill its promise out of disappointment and resentment. 